Hi guys, in today's episode of Taylor Talks Trades, we're with Richard O'Donnell from Insure Repair. He's speaking about the insurance industry, how he's put a personal approach on it, and he's also talking to us about his up and coming new projects. I hope you enjoy. So, welcome on Richard. Thank you very I'll, much for having me. I'll start where I always start. How did you get into the trades? I um, left school, I was a early leaver at 15, and uh, in fact, I wanted to be a mechanic. Right. Funnily enough, I wanted to be a mechanic. I did work experience as a mechanic for the three or four days that you do it, and was promised a job with uh, Vauxhall. Mm -hmm. And um, so I left school, went back to Vauxhall looking for my job, and uh, the guy had left, and they had no record of me as a work experience candidate or the potentially a job. So I was like, oh, great. And, um, Oh no! So then, that, then I was fifteen, sending letters out, you know, yep. to people, um, to companies looking for a job. And at that age, what chance have you got? And uh, one of my uncles contacted me, who was in the insurance reinstatement industry, right. and said, "Do you want to come on board with us as an apprentice?" Mm -hmm. I said, "Absolutely." Um, so he says, "Well, I've got a position as an electrical apprentice. Come on board, see how you get on." Mm -hmm. So I did that. Um, and by probably the second week, I realised I never wanted to be an electrician. Um, no interesting enough for me, uh, no exciting enough, um, but I definitely was interested in the insurance reinstatement industry. Um, and more, more to the point because, as a kid, you don't know that exists, that industry, that it's an actual I industry know you're itself. right, aye, aye. You don't know Because I'm saying get into the trades, but it's like, that's all the trades, isn't it? It's, it's, a, it's just a totally different industry. Aye. And you don't know about home insurance, you've never owned a home at that point. Um, so, you know, I was very interested in that. And, you know, I, I liked the organisation, I liked the fact that, that there was a project where all the trades were on site at various different times. I liked the whole, I didn't like, but the fact, it amazed me the fact that the property was either fire damaged or smoke damaged or flood damaged and turning it, you know, reinstating it back to its pre loss condition. That was all pretty cool to me. Uh, so, that's what inspired me to. Yeah. To carry on through the trade. Yeah. Um, so what happened? with like, so did did you do the ele uh, the electrician's apprenticeship, or did you kind of stop that and then move? Or I did do did... that. I did that for a while, and then it became apparent I was uh, colourblind. Right. <laughs> Just a tad. Right. But <laughs> enough that that you, you know, uh, it might be important. You know what? This guy working on uh, cables. Um, <laughs> So that, that was that was what I did there. During oh, my man. apprenticeship. Just that ad. No. <laughs> At the college as well. Oh, no. And I'd passed colourblind tests because ah. it's a regular, it's a, yep. it's a thing that you go through. Yep. And I passed them and then I'd failed one and the, and the lecturer was like, Richard, are you kidding me on today? And I was like, no, what's happened? And have you seen a colourblind test before? No, I've no actually, no. It's a, an assortment of colours. Right. And if you're not colourblind, you'll see there's a number there, like number nine or whatever number it may be. Right. If you are colourblind, you'll just see colours. Oh, really? That's Aye. interesting. Um, so, yeah, it became apparent I was so colourblind. you couldn't see any of the numbers then? I'm Some of them. Ah, right. Aye, so just a, just a, it's a shading thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so that was the situation there. At the same time, I didn't really want to be an electrician at that point. And the company I worked for were certainly not treating me as an electrical apprentice. Right. They were giving me all trades experience. Mm -hmm. So I was working all the time with... Um, Plasterers or joiners or decorators, um, everyone, heating engineers a lot. Um, the, a vast amount of experience. The surveyors were taking me off jobs and taking me with them to go and you know, check out surveying jobs. The contracts manager was doing the same thing. The owner of the business would sometimes pick me up from jobs and, and, and take me around other sites and whatnot. A huge amount of experience. I just knew that's where I wanted to be, that's what I wanted that's to amazing, do. Man. And so that's kind of how I got involved in that. Yeah. And then how did that progress then? So was this with your uncle's company you were saying? Yes. And then what? how did you evolve to what happened after that? So at that point, I was working there for a while. And then when I left there, working with family and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so no big drama, just that's how it went. Mm -hmm. uh, I left there and I, I wanted to get... I actually just wanted to save up to get a mortgage mm -hmm. to get my first flat. Yeah. Um, so I got myself an office job, got out the trade, got an office job thinking it would be more money than an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. um, I'd get, I'd save up enough for a deposit and then decide what I'm doing from there. Mm -hmm. um, so I left there, got an office job at one of the one of the banks, 
and was amazed at all the things I didn't know. So I learned about customer values. I learned about um, you know st structuring your your day to day workload mm. uh, from a, a desk point of view. Um, it was, it was, it was uh, asset finance that I was dealing with. Yeah. So I quickly did quite well in there, mm. and ended up being in a, a, a wee elite team that, that did the funding for the likes of back then it was uh, David Beckham, Dwight York, oh. uh, all the footballers that were buying crazy Lambos all the time. Aye. And um, that was really interesting, but it did teach me, it did make you grow up. Yep. Um, as an apprentice, you're the laddie until you leave. Mm -hmm. Regardless, if you're there for four years, you're still the laddie until you leave. Mm -hmm. Leave, maybe come back as a tradesman. Mm -hmm. um, in an office environment, you, you're only the junior until you're trained. Mm -hmm. So, you know, quickly trained. That's a good point, actually. I had never sent an email up until that point. Mm -hmm. You know, you're young, mm -hmm. and uh, it was all fairly new um, back then. I'm 40 now. So um, sent emails, as I say, customer values, and interaction with grown adults, treating you as a grown adult, even though you're just a wee teenager. Yeah, yeah. Um, or as so you think. They just see you as, as, as uh, someone in the office. So that was good. Saved up my deposit to buy my first flat, and then launched my business, mm -hmm. and, uh, and took it from there. Aye. Yeah. And, and is that insure repair? So is that at that? Is it, was that is it that, that your first, was it insure repair? I sorry. <laughs> so it wasn't called that originally. It was called property repair. Right, right. Um, and I rebranded it as insure repair predominantly because it's insurance reinstatement work that we do. And the previous name would give you the impression that you do other work. Yeah, and we're, makes sense. We're constantly to... And did you at that time? Was it just insurance that you were doing when you got into that, or was it a bit of everything and then you niched down or? No, we, well, we've always just done two, it's always been two services mainly. It's yeah. been insurance repairs or renovations. Yeah. Insurance repairs predominantly and the renovations because we carry all the trades. Mm -hmm. So that's, that, that was why. Um, but we didn't, the, believe it or not, when it, the previous name before we rebranded um, all those years ago, the previous name would indicate any type of repair in a property. Mm -hmm. And you'd get things like, I've got a cracked tile, can you come out and do that? And, and it was just a waste of their time phoning yeah. us. And, and uh, you know, it was just a delay and I was having to say, sorry, we can't help you, you can go elsewhere, I recommend people and whatnot. So uh, when the decision was, was made to, to rebrand, mm -hmm. it was definitely the right decision. Yeah. Um, and, and, and obviously we work for various insurance companies, brokers, loss adjusters, and that name is synonymous with that industry. So it's, it's, it's obvious what you're doing. It's ideal, well, yeah. Eh? Like it. it is. Aye, it does what it says on the tin. Yep, absolutely. Um, Nah, it's good. The brand looks really good as well. It's strong. Thank you. you. See, the, Thank see you. the vehicles and, that and the, like, the wraps and everything. It, it comes together good. The video content that you've got on your website and all of that. So yep. you've obviously put a lot into it. Ah, thanks um, very much. Nah. It matters. You know, you want the... See, we're a, we're a public um, orientated business. Mm -hmm. So in the insurance reinstatement industry, the public think that you always contact your insurer and they'll help you from there on in. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not always the case. It's yeah. it's far less the case than you'd imagine. In reality, um, various insurers don't have a network, um, and so they or a panel, and so they will bounce that straight back to the policyholder, as as is their model to do so, mm -hmm. and state that the policyholder must uh, obtain two or three estimates, mm -hmm. bona fide reinstatement estimates. Yeah. But nonetheless, they, they've got to go ahead and do that themselves, and they don't always know who to call. Yeah. And the influx of calls we get on a daily basis because of that model, back then and to this day, yeah. is incredible. Um, because for, from an insurer's point of view, having a network of contractors is expensive. Yeah. It's, it's one of the few costs of their business. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's not always viable for them to do it. Um, it takes a lot to put it in place. Mm -hmm. And so it's sometimes easier for them to tell the policy or that, you know, we'll carry on with your claim once we approve the two or three yep. you know, out of the two or three estimates that you get, once we approve the one that, that, that fits this claim. Yep. And then they'll either settle direct with the contractor or they'll you know, settle direct with the policy holder. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Quite interesting. So it's really you guys are you guys ever like the first call then? If somebody might say, I've had an issue and they would maybe call you and then would you say, right, this is what you need to do and then you need to you then direct them to contact their insurance company or Sometimes, is, it, yeah. is there a bit of that yeah. as well? Yeah. Because it is interesting because you just always you kinda pay your insurance and you hope you'll never need to use it. But when that moment yeah. comes up, you 
homeowners probably worry a wee bit. Where do I go? What do I do? Before I started my business, when I was only 18, uh, and I had my first flat there, yeah. um, I, I was flooded from the chap upstairs. <laughs> I know. And, uh, you know, so I was already knew I was going to I was going to set up in business in the insurance yeah. reinstatement industry, but I'd never experienced it as a customer. Yeah. And I was flooded by old Dennis up the stairs, who, when I went up to see him, he professed, it's not me, son. That's not my pipes. Your pipes above you. I thought that that will be right. So that kind of experience, it made me think like, come on, Dennis. Um, my insurers were quite a good insurer. They got involved. Um, they appointed a contractor. The contractor did the reinstatement, and that was all fine. And just watching the process happen again from a customer point of view, it just solidified the the fact that that is definitely um, you know. So you've seen the gap in the market. Somebody needs to. Well, there wasn't a gap, no. right? Because it was it's actually. The competitors were good. Yeah. Um, there, there just was potentially the competitors were good in terms of they knew what they were doing, mm -hmm. but they didn't potentially, you know, work with the policyholder as well as they could yeah. do. They were just receiving claims from insurers, claims from adjusters, but not being very public faced. Yeah. And I felt that was lacking. So you put a bit more of a personal experience on it and kind yeah. of try to guide the. I understand what you're saying because it, it's almost like if we're if we're working for a homeowner, then there's a personal relationship there. If we're working for an insurance company, there's almost like this third party now, and it's yeah. like it's like we we're quite big on that as well. Where we'll try to actually communicate with the homeowner as well and be like, look, this is when we're coming, this is what we're doing, because it's very easy for it to get stuck in the chain and then the communication drops. So it is, it really that, is. That and sounds... um, you've got to remember that the, the public don't know what you know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not their fault. You know, they're 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 laymen's in terms of our industry. Yeah. We're probably laymen's in, in the industry they're in, etc. Yeah. We're all people. So I just I just felt that as much as there's there was good comp the re there was really good competition actually. Um the the, con the other competitive contractors were good, mm -hmm. but there was little in the way of directly assisting the public. Yeah. And that was needed. Mm -hmm. You know, down it's, it's down England. It's still kind of like that. Actually, mm -hmm. we're better up here in terms of uh, public facing businesses. Down England, they, they still mostly take their instruction from a network or a, an adjuster or an insurer. It's rarely that the the, the marketing to assist the public yeah. in the insurance reinstatement industry anyway. Yeah. So we did and we do uh, for that reason. Mm -hmm. So you had a a good bit of self belief in you. I did. I just well, I've learned a lot. Mm -hmm. So I've learned a lot. Uh, it's not often that an apprentice gets to sample other trades as well as doing his job. So as well as working with electricians, I did work with uh, decorators, plasterers, joiners, heating engineers regularly. Mm -hmm. And so it would, it would get to the point where a particular tradesman would say, can I have Richard today? Yeah. Because I might be good at helping him with whatever. Yeah. Um, or an electrician might want me that day because I'm able to go on the floors and, and he might not want to go on the yeah. floors because he's not an apprentice anymore. Right. Uh, uh, you know, or that sort of thing. Um, certainly dropped a load of ceilings as an apprentice. Yeah. A lot of lath and plaster ceilings. So I learned the importance, and this was from the, the owner of the business that, that we worked for, um, the importance of polythening everything, taping everything, um, and just making sure that everything was adequately protected. And then dropping that lath and plaster ceiling, yeah. tidying up was important before you started resheating. And just, just the mechanisms of you know how you how you carry out the the job. So I'd learned a lot. So when I um, decided to launch my company, uh, I knew exactly what you know uh, um, you know theory wise yeah. what I wanted to achieve and yep. um, what I could achieve, and then just put it into practice. No, oh, that's good. And uh, for the first the first year was incredible. Um, didn't know what to expect, so I didn't know really what would be good or bad. I just wanted to uh, not fail. Die. <laughs> And then uh, in year two, so we, we were just helping the public in, in year one. Year two, a, a handful of loss adjusters, all within a few months, contacted the company to say, you actually helped us last year with a claim for Mrs. Such and Such or Mr. Such and yeah, Such. Yeah. Uh, we were really impressed with, with how you carried it out and, and the duration of the claim was shorter than we'd expect. Um, and the postal was delighted and um, we'd like you to help us out with, with more claims. And, That's brilliant. And it kind of went off yep. went off from there. Yeah, and then you just start to make a bit of a name in the industry for yourself. Aye, oh, so brilliant. That, that was... Uh, that was brilliant. Aye, so that, that, was, that was kind and of... And what sort of... Um, so that was 2004 you started then? Yes. Um, and 
so I was probably a bit keen to see like how did the did the recession affect you? The, like sort of the, the two thousand and eight crash, as they call it, was that something that impacted you, or were you? Uh, I attended an insurance seminar around that time, yep. where the, the thought was that because it was a credit crunch, and the public would generally have less money, the worry was that there would be loads of fraudulent claims, yep. and that didn't happen. Oh. Um, so claims actually slowed down a little bit, yep. but but the influx of fraudulent claims that was expected didn't happen. Oh, um, so that that was interesting because we all kind of agreed that that, that might there might be a concern that that would be. Uh, that, that 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 could happen, but it didn't. It didn't. Um, mm. and it so would make sense that it's not something I would I even have thought of. But no. it's like so. I attended uh, that seminar. That's what that was the concern from the insurers. It certainly didn't play out that way. Claims dipped a little bit, but pretty much remained the same. Yeah. Um, so the credit crunch for us was okay. Mm -hmm. um, the recession was all for us was okay. Uh, in terms of me personally, obviously, um, I was able to then buy a lot of properties. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of that, because things were you know a bit cheaper and whatnot, and yeah. now is the time sort of thing. Yeah, that's good. Um, so yeah. And and how's it progressed over the years for there then? So like when you first started, was that just you yourself, or you brought in kind of a team round about you now? I'm guessing. And yeah. So first started, it was uh, me from a room in my first flat yep. with a desk and how is this everyone... the one that got flooded. <laughs> <It> was, uh, <laughs> just uh, so just just based on a room in that flat. Yeah and operating with a, a, a bunch of really good uh, subcontractor yep. trades. Yep. And then, uh, you know, a year later, that we had, we had a, uh, three staff on the books, and then four, and then five, and then progressed from there. So that's kind of how it did. And then in 2006, I bought the offices that in Edinburgh and Montrose Terrace, mm -hmm. um, just by chance, actually. It was it's a really good street that we're on because it's, Right in the centre of town, really, mm -hmm. um, but there's there's free parking. Oh, and I've really? always said that I'd love an office in the street because you can park, and ah, it's densely populated with tenements. And you know, yep. we obviously help the public. And I was passing one day, and there was a a board up to let, and so I nipped in, pulled over, nipped in, and the chap was doing viewings. Nipped in, spoke to him, and kind of convinced him to that it was a better idea to sell. Yeah. Um, of which he did. He accepted he accepted my offer within a couple of weeks, and then I bought it. Um, so it's, a, it's one of the best things I've done because it gave us a solid base that we owned and we just took obviously took off from there. Yeah. No longer a home-based business. Now it was an office with yeah. office staff and, and, and the trades that worked for us could come directly to the office and yep. no longer to my flat. Um, <laughs> so yeah. So I've done that a few times just in between like moving offices and stuff as well and we were like running out of the kitchen and of course. like vans at the house and all that and like the guys coming into your actual kitchen and you're like people didn't see that actually that sometimes that's just you've got to do what needs to be done you but do, it's um that you can go through some crazy moments like that and you, you you actually you actually forget what it's like to then have the office and then when we got moved again and stuff you're like oh that's great like <laughs> out of the kitchen again and stuff but yeah sometimes there's just wee bits like that where you've just got to make it happen and and, and kind of push on what about the 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 branding back then? Was that as important as what it is now? Because it's yeah, it was it was important. Aye, it was just it was just um, it was massively important, yeah. and that's that was what differentiated you. Well, back then it was the yellow pages. Yeah. So you you had to make sure that your logo, your brand, your your service offering was as such that that you would be the person that was called, or at least one of them. Yeah. Um, and that certainly was the case, mm -hmm. um, and I. And so, yeah, branding was massively important back then. As just as important as it is now. Yeah, the L yeah, I forgot about the yellow pages. To be honest, it was brilliant. I know, it was like, really good I know back like then. the company, the company that I served my apprenticeship with, like I think they were like big in the yellow pages. Uh, we like, were, back we, then. we were, we really did invest heavily in the yellow pages. Was was that as in competitive as like what everything is now, or easier, or it was easier? Was it? It was easier because. If you had a good reputation, which which you would develop quickly, yeah. uh, you know, good tr good news travels fast, yeah. um, and everyone resorted re reverted to the yellow pages for yeah. whatever service they were looking for, yeah. and we'd be listed in builders, we'd be listed in fire and flood damage oh, restoration, so different roofers, joiners, so we'd be listed in all of them, so we could be captured, because some most of the time people would just go, I need a builder, yeah. but they don't specifically need a builder because yeah. we're not building a house, yeah. but for the public's perception, they need a builder, so they go to the building section, yeah. look for a company they vaguely recognise or a company that potentially looks like they could do the job well, 
and so yeah, branding was massively important for that perspective. But Yellow Pages was good; it, it really did work. Uh, Yell dot com was also good when it first started out. Yeah. You know, that was that was a big medium for public claims and public uh, renovations for us. So yeah, is there is there a lot of do you do a lot of private work now, like for private homeowners? Is it all predominantly the insurance company, or it's, is there still a split there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we do. We do a vast amount of reinstatements for the, the public in terms of claims. We do renovation work in mostly in Edinburgh renovation work. So new town of Edinburgh, cellar conversions, full renovations, um, and we can, we we organise that with military precision because we've got all the trades. Yeah. So it gets booked in. We've got set service levels as well, so it, it gets booked in on an exact date. Yeah. It, there's an estimated completion date, which is there or thereabouts, and we provide a 24 months guarantee yeah. with further innovations as well as the insurance reinstatement work. Yeah, sure, okay. um, so yeah, the public um, and insurer-led stuff. There is a split, and uh, we cater to both. And have you got a have you got a lot of guys on your books then, or do you still got the kind of subcontractor kind of model, or is that a bit of we, we again we split it um, yep. just because the, the the amount of trades we carry is, is it's a lot, is a it? lot. Yeah, and it's varied um, as well. And the market can sometimes you know can shift yeah. one way or another, so we we always keep a nice a nice split yep. sixty forty between guys in the books yep. and uh, subcontractors. I, I take my hat off to guys like yourself that has to balance all them trades because it's like yeah. I know how hard it is with one trade. You know we're just predominantly roofing. There is sometimes maybe the the rendering side there and and stuff that ties in closely with roofing, but predominantly it's roofing. So I can only trades. imagine when you're and we sometimes get it as well. Like there maybe um, something happens when we're on a job or maybe we're actually working for somebody and they say, "Oh, do you know a?" such and such, you know, a joiner or a, a painting and decorator or whatever, and it's like, sometimes you've got to bring the trades in and you try and help a customer, but it's really tough. Yeah. It's a real tough thing to do, so. But to be fair, the guys are all, they're all good at working together. Yeah. You know, they're, they're a good bunch of guys that look out for each other. You you, also, you would also know pretty quickly if there was an idiot in the squad, because mm -hmm. the guys will not have it. Aye. You know, they're quite quick to, to discuss the fact that that person who's been in the job two or three days might not be the one. Yeah. Sometimes persevere, they'll, they'll, yeah. they'll be okay, but most of the time the team will tell you. Yeah. Um, so they do, they work well together, they've, they've got certain ways of working, mm -hmm. uh, they're a big squad, um, and so and they, so they help each other. Because yeah. the idea is obviously to you know make sure the policy holder is, is happy when you arrive, happy when you leave, you know, and everything in between. So, no, they're a good bunch. Going forward then, what's the growth of insure repair looking like? It's really good. Um, so we cover all of the central belt um, with great ease and, and, and we move up or down uh, depending on if there's a surge of claims or the insurance companies you know, request us to go to a certain area, we can do it. Um, for example, in 2009, insurers requested or asked if we could set up a base to cover the chest, uh, the company of Cockermouth floods back mm -hmm. in 2009, yep. 2010. So we did that. We set up a base in Sheffield. And um, we operated in Sheffield, Rotherham, Doncaster, and just mirrored the service That's down there. Aye. It was really good. It was aye. about a year and a half, actually, because yep. we, we, we dealt with the surge and then all the resulting claims uh, off the back, uh, reinstatement claims off the back of it. And then, so that was really good. We, then we found all our staff jobs after that uh -huh. before, you know, closing the doors on Sheffield yep. and, and moving back up here. So That's interesting. in the insurance industry, you've, you know, you, you've got to help. Yep. So if there's a surge anywhere, you should really be looking to try and help the insurers mm -hmm. and go there. Mm -hmm. um, so, comfortably, our, our area is the central belt yeah. uh, of Scotland. Um, we're looking at offices in Glasgow mm -hmm. um, because that's that's a no-brainer. Yeah. Um, it doesn't seem that far between Edinburgh and Glasgow, and we do centre. We've got trades in Glasgow now. Yeah. Um, but it will be far easier when we launch the office in Glasgow. It does um, make sense because then it's like Edinburgh to Glasgow's maybe not as far, but then when you start going to like the other side of Glasgow, of it, that is that is far. So um, that's 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 where we're looking at there. We've you know we've, we've obtained insurer clients, loss adjuster clients, mm -hmm. intermediaries, uh, BRNs, um, and obviously the public. We're helping the public. Um, so that's the growth. The model is just as it is, and just to, just to grow it. And would you think you would ever take it all over the UK, like what you were saying with the, like when you went down and set up in Cumbria with like Sheffield? Is that something you would want to do again? I don't or? know. It's, it's interesting. I would I would allow insure repair to be set up in London mm -hmm. because it's a similar, obviously on a, a, a larger scale, but 
the models, the, the sort of the, the requirements the same. Mm -hmm. um, so I would consider London, um, and there's there's been there's, there's ongoing talks about that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, insure repair would I would certainly consider insure repair in London um, because it, it would be the same service as we carry out up here, densely populated area, some high net worth, a yeah. huge requirement for the service. Yeah. So I would consider um, London, yeah. So what does the future hold then? Um, well, the immediate future, um, in November, uh, we launch emergency repair. Mm -hmm. Emergency repair is obviously a UK contractor uh, network of yeah. emergency contractors. Uh, and see, at the moment, it doesn't, it doesn't actually exist mm -hmm. where the public have got direct access to emergency contractors that will definitely turn up. Yeah. Um, and our, our software is such that when the when the customer phones up for for an emergency job, they prepay. Yeah. So they they, they pick the service they're looking for. So say it's emergency plumbing, mm -hmm. they prepay, and they they receive an email back that says you know um, our emergency plumber um, will be with you within two hours. Yeah. Which they will be there within two hours. Uh, they attend. They make it safe, and they leave. Yeah. There's no time spent you know trying to fix everything on emergency rates. It's just mm -hmm. get out there and make it safe. Yeah. Um, and that's that's what's going to be happening. All across. We've, we've, we've carried out a soft launch this year, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it went really, really well. That's good. Um, and the network of contractors we, that we've got, most of them worked for us in 2009 when we had our office in Sheffield. Oh, brilliant. Um, so they've all been, most of them have been tried and tested. They're really, really, really uh, good. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so we're looking forward to that launching. It's been a lot behind the scenes, uh, website branding, yeah. you know, all that, you know, all that sort of stuff. And you know, we've done that for a while. We're running your like quite a long in, time in um, repair for so long, and yeah. then so it's like it's back back to it again. So and the the last part of the jigsaw was the software, uh -huh. um, just to bring all that in because it, it's a lot of interaction with the customer, um, just so they know what's happening and when, and yeah. so they can they can track the tradesman, mm -hmm. um, you know, and when he's going to be there, when he when he's completed the make safe. The customer signs it off, so it tells our system that uh, the job's been carried out and that they're happy. And then that system automatically pays the tradesman mm -hmm. uh, or the sort of tradesperson yeah, yeah, within yeah. forty-eight hours. So oh, it's, it's really, really it's, it's kind of one, one, one for everybody. Then it's really, a great service, and um, the the soft launch went brilliantly, mm -hmm. um, and it's good for the public because they. Okay, they can phone an emergency plumber or an emergency roofer, and they can, in the chap will say, or, or the office of that company will say, "Yeah, we'll be with you within a couple of hours." That's fine, but what if they don't show up? Yeah, yeah. So this way, we've got more than enough trades than we need, more than enough. Um, you know, you know, six of every trade in every single postcode area is, yep. is the idea. And so, when when they receive, when they're told that we're coming, mm -hmm. emergency repair are coming. Yeah. And they'll get an email to that effect. They can track the tradesman. The tradesman arrives, does the make safe, and and leaves. And yeah. it's a straightforward service. They're not thinking, will he, will he, or will she turn up or not? Yeah, because that's a big worry for homeowners, especially if there's a leak or it's something's happening worry. there and then, and the weather's against them. It's a huge worry. And all the while, if it's a leak, the water, the, the, the damage is getting it's worse. Getting worse, yeah. So if you know that within two hours, the trade, it's usually about thirty-five minutes. Yeah. You know, but say within two hours the tradesperson is going to attend. Mm -hmm. That's a huge weight off your shoulders in that moment of time when you need them. Absolutely. Um, and there's in that market, there's a lot of um, over promising and under delivering, mm -hmm. and this does the opposite. That's amazing. Um, so yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Everyone's ready. It could launch yeah. now. But yeah. We're just kind of we'd said for months we're going to launch it middle of November, so we're we're, we're leaving it. It's at good that. timing with the weather that will be just around the corner. Yes. Well, eh? So we'll be able to help a lot of people. You're going to um, be busy this winter, then, um, that's for sure. And the growth of insure repair, when you mentioned that earlier, yep. it, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that there'll be you know hundreds of claims mm -hmm. that that occur mm -hmm. off the back of any number of these emergencies. Yeah. And so it may well be that insure repair grow to service that. Ah, oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it might be that you've went out, you've made it safe, and then it's like if you actually need it reinstated, they yeah. could then come to insure repair. Yes, that's potential. Makes sense. That's it makes sense. That's potential growth for yep. the future. And it's good for the the client or the homeowner as well, because then they're not exactly tied in with that. It's like it's almost like this bit separate. Yes. Get them some breathing room and allow them to kind of calm down after that happening, and then they'll probably be quite 
impressed by the service, I would imagine. Absolutely. I think if insure repair is going to be the same, then they'll probably want to use them. So well, nobody wants the sense. emergency company coming out, standing there trying to fix everything on emergency rates and then trying to upsell, etc. Yeah. So it's just you know, standalone service, get out there, make it safe. That's it does make important. sense. Yeah. It does make sense. Because we even like we've we've got quite a good setup like with the roof in and um like we struggle for emergency stuff. Like we're no like a lot of our work's proactive and it's all booked in and it's planned and we're good for an organization uh, an organize, organizational point of view and communicating with customers and letting them know that we will be there when we say we will. But when the weather turns really bad, like we are not really a reactive company and a lot of the time we're kind of like well, we we might be able to get to you, but we never promise because, like you said, we don't want to over promise and under deliver. Insure and repair is the same. Yeah, insure repair are not a reactive company at all. It's hard because that's it, why it should be it a puts a service. Yeah, it puts a spoke in the wheel. Of, like your company, if you squeeze something in, it's then going to have a knock on effect somewhere else. Yeah. So nah, it's been it's several years. Do you guys? Could you guys not carry out emergencies? And the answer really is no. Mm-hmm. Insure repair. The business model is such that we carry out reinstatement work after the fact. Yeah. You want you want to be phoning the company that can help you now. Yeah, no, you're right. And so emergency repair is nothing to do with insure repair. It's a yeah. standalone service. It's got a network of subcontractors. Yeah. They're not on the books. Mm-hmm. They don't need to be on the books. Mm-hmm. Um, the business and the model is such that they attend within two hours. They make it safe and they leave. Yeah. And these guys or girls as well that's going to be attending, they're going to want to attend because they're going to want to be part of that model. Do you know yeah. they're going to have an obligation to be like, well. This is good that I'm getting the calls for this. So we're getting um, must be up to ten inquiries a day well, across the UK from trades trying to add to the trying to join yeah, the panel, that and that's based on a soft launch in some some small marketing. Yeah. That's because the, the the actual model makes perfect sense. Yeah. It's needed. No, that's good. So yeah, looking forward to that. That's in, that's in November, Brilliant. and uh, you know we'll see where that where that where that goes. Brilliant. No, that's awesome, mate. Thanks for coming on and sharing that with us. Just Thanks again. Cheers. Good man.